Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. This is an old-timers meeting. we got a lot of seniors here in sobriety, and uh, those of you who have 20 years or more are going to be invited up here to speak, and uh, we ask that you share heart-to-heart. I do that. I ask that. And uh, consider uh, what you might say to help uh, the rest of us grow. That would be important. And as an audience, I ask you to open your minds and your hearts to these speakers, and let's have an exciting time. I'm Pat Alcoholic. Hey, uh, Moved here six years ago from Dallas, and uh, Georgetown was our home group. So I really related last night. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I took my last drink in a in a Oakland tavern. Actually, it was the Greyhound bus depot. <laughs> Three days before Christmas, 1970. So I'm very grateful for that. A little over 41 years and change. So I don't have anything profound to say. I mean, I've really enjoyed this bash so far. It's amazing. And uh, I'm always slow. I'm getting older, so I'm slower catching up with, you know, the topic and stuff like that. So I've just figured out now why, you know, what's important about the bash to me. And it's coming to me about spiritual awakening. So uh, having said those things, uh, a lot of meetings over a lot of years, and I'm certainly grateful for that. And everybody in my family is grateful for that. <laughs> and my neighbors are grateful for that. I don't park in their garden anymore, you know, and <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, it's it's been it's been a real journey, you know. I really pay attention to the newcomer. Uh, my sponsor's 50th birthday was two weeks ago in Oahu, and we went over there, and there were six of us there that he had sponsored um, in, ni- in 1970, you know, in 71, and it was really really cool. So I gave him the appropriate thing for his 50th birthday. I gave him a 24-hour chip, <laughs> yeah. and he really understood that. But he always said, listen to the newcomer, be your sponsor tomorrow. So I do that, you know. I do that. The newcomer is the most important in the room for me. And I, you know, so many of you I know here in Kona, and I've met a bunch of you since. My friends from Hilo from years ago, it's wonderful being here. And I just really have one thing to say to newcomers. You want to guess? You guys, come all the way in and sit all the way down. Thank you so much. Aloha, everybody. My name's June, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm from Palm Desert, California. Yay. And I have, uh, I'm here with two of my dear, dear friends. One of them is one of my babies, and she can almost come up here. A few months, and she's going to have 20 years. How about that? And um, I'm here today because um, I'm sober, and that's a miracle. And I'm here today because God lets me do this one day at a time. Anyway, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to welcome all the newcomers and all the relative newcomers. And I'd like to wish you just a little bit of what I found here. My sobriety date is January 10th, 1990. So that gives me a lot of one day at a time. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be on Kona. I've never been to this big bash. I've been to Maui Fest uh, seven times, and it was very good. And th- this year it's going to clash with our powwow. So we came here instead, and I'm glad we did because we get to meet uh, new friends and new faces and a lot of old ones, too, that we saw over there in Maui. <clears throat> Anyway, I won't take up too much of your time. I'm, I, I'd like to tell you that I, I, when I got sober, I thought that I was going to learn how to drink like a lady. And then I would be, you know, my husband wouldn't be mad at me anymore every day. He wouldn't have my car towed. My children would love me more. 
And, you know, all those things happen. But besides that, you know, I like the person looking back at me in the mirror now. And I hated that woman. The day before I went into treatment, I hated that woman that looked back at me in the mirror. She was, she did things that I can't even perceive. I can't even, I, it, I would never, I did things that I would never ever do if it hadn't have been for King Alcohol. You know, giving me that uh, nudge, that nudge to do things that I never would have done otherwise. Anyway, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy all of you are here, too. Thank you. On uh, April 1, I got this chip that has a 36 on it. I, uh, I, uh... My mother tells me when I was born, she would try to, I was the first born, and she would try to cuddle me and hold me. And when she did that, I would stiffen and scream until she put me on the ground. And then, uh, when I was a little older than that, uh, whenever I heard some word that I still don't give very well, no, I would lay on the ground and I'd kick my hands and feet and scream. And then, I can remember I always, uh, I rode my bike to school most of the time because if I got to the bus stop a little early, the kids would beat the crap out of me. And at the playground, I used to have to uh, hang around by the teacher because if I got where they weren't there, I'd get beat up. So I went to Paso Robles when I was 15, and a guy took me to the fair and brought me a six-pack of beer. Drank it. It was the first time I ever belonged. I had been waiting for the aliens that brought me here to come and get me and take me where I belong. And I drank six beers like everybody. It was a wonderful world. So then, a little while after that, a second or third time I got drunk. I came home uh, drunk, and my dad the next day told me this stupid shit story about him being an alcoholic. And these meetings he goes to twice a week. I thought everyone's dad went to meetings. <laughs> and uh, that he couldn't drink and all this crap. So I listened to that, and that was a nice story. And then I, I worked really hard from 15 to 20, uh, trying to perfect two drinks. Uh, it was probably every other weekend, so, you know, 25 times over five years. is Anyway, that's about how many times. I tried to have two drinks, and I always ended up, I had two drinks for sure, and then <laughs> it was four in the morning, and I drank a quart. And um, so at 20, I remembered everything I had done. I was scared of dying, and uh, I was really scared of dying because I remember all the stuff I was doing. I was going to kill myself in the car on the freeway going really fast. And um, so I went to an AA meeting in Laguna. At the meeting, and somebody said, well, if you don't drink alcohol, you won't have, you won't get drunk. Oh, that works. <laughs> so I spent from uh, 20 to 26 going to AA meetings, smoking dope, and taking amphetamines. <laughs> and uh, the the that's where the serenity prayer comes along because. Anything that I needed to do, I could take amphetamines, and anything I needed to accept, I could just smoke dope. <laughs> and uh, I had got, I had gone to AA because I didn't want to die. And then going to these meetings and everything, I got, I got this envy. I mean, it was all these assholes there were happy. <laughs> And I was so jealous of him being happy. And so by the time I was 26, uh, I wanted to be dead because I was so miserable. I, it was, I discovered pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And so one day I'm cruising down the road, and it occurred to me that that day I'd had a, I hadn't drank or used dope or anything. I had an all right day. And I kept thinking, when are you going to get it? And I said, well, you did it today. So when I got back, uh, th 36 years ago now, uh, I got rid of the drugs that, and I keep going to the meetings. And um, I had a great day yesterday. 
I've had a great day today. Almost all the last 36 years, almost every day has been great. I went to a, I went to a, a high school I graduated from with uh, no position whatsoever. And I ran it, I ran the school for 10 or 12 years and like doubled the enrollment and made it to where instead of losing money, it made it. And I have the same old wife 44 years later I can't get rid of. <laughs> uh, I never got a DUI. I've had some hard economic times where I had to buy a used Porsche instead of a new one. <laughs> and, uh, so I don't have a, you know, I, I thought about it a long time. I never did take chips because the people would come and tell their stories and they, they would talk about, uh, you know, like a friend of mine, Tommy, lived in the garbage can, the big dumpster behind Ohio Street and he would keep the end clear and he would go into Ohio Street to get donuts. And my story was stupid compared to his because he really had some problems. So uh, I think 13 years ago, this chip's got 23 on it. About, it was probably 13 years ago, my second son called. And he said, hey, Dad, why don't you come down to the Monday night meeting because I'm going to get a one-year chip. Turns out his birthday was April 1, 2. We're both April Fools. <laughs> So I keep my 23-year chip that he gave me. I've kept it in my pocket for 13 years, and then I get a new chip every year. And the thing that I figured out uh, in the 36 years that's clear to me now is that I'm alcoholic, and I my mind hates me and wants me to be miserable. And my perception is defective and I could look at a solid gold thing and think it was crap and I do that if I don't go to meetings all the time and you folks are my vision you're my eyes you're my perspective you teach me everything I need to know and you remind me that all I want to do is be happy and you're happy by doing these things. And if I do the things that you do, I'm happy. And if I do the things that my mind comes up with, I'm in a good position and miserable and want to be dead. And I, I love the happy. I'm really grateful for the happy. And of late I figured out the serenity prayer. You know, I, I, I was sure that, you know, if you take amphetamines, whatever you got to do, you can do it. In fact, you don't even need to do what you're supposed to do. You just do something. <laughs> and uh, dope, you can smoke enough dope to put it with anything, right? But they never did make a wisdom pill. That was a bad, there was no wisdom pill. <laughs> and it occurred to me only in the last few years that the, the key to the uh, serenity prayer and the key to my life is that the only thing I really can change is me. I can, I can, I have this thing about my reaction to my reaction. I react to things badly first, and then uh, now I don't do anything. I count to one or ten million, whatever it takes. <laughs> and then I react and I, I act and I pretend and I act like one of you instead of like me. And I could change that. The things I can't change is everything else. I can't change you. The, I can't change anything else. I might be able to paint my house a different color, but that's about it. <laughs> so all of the things about me, I get to get up in the morning and make a choice. I can accept it or not. And what I found out of late is that if I not, if I go past accepting it, but I like it, I can have a really better day. So. I don't, the acceptance is too low. I need to like what happens. And I just want to tell you my example of liking now and how it works. I had a nephew, 20, he was 25, and I talked to him some, and he went back east, and he was always having a hard time, went to jail and everything, and I called him, and he took him to a few meetings, and he called me up once, 
uh, he just got out and he was sitting in an apartment, couldn't get to a meeting, and he was sitting there waiting for a parole officer to approve where he lived. I said, call me in three days. I got a call a week later, and he had, he had come up with a scheme. He never, he said, when I talked to him, he said, I never want to drink again. So he found this scheme to never drink again. Uh, and it worked. He sat in the apartment and he, he told his, his cousin that he was going to drink so much that he would never want to drink again. And it worked. Because he, he died. Killed him. And I went to his funeral and his grandmother was there and had buried herself financial enabling this kid. And we're, and we're burying him and she comes up to me and I'm feeling bad. And she comes up to me. She's not programming nothing. She says, the whole time I knew DJ, I would pray that God would take his hand and take it where he needed to be. <laughs> and she says to me, I didn't know that where he needed to be was with God, but I do now. Because he didn't belong here. So I learned to accept and be happy with what happens with DJ. I have three sons. My second son is sober. He lives next door to my first son in a house. That I set up a trust to put a house in it. I pay the taxes and the insurance. My son makes a marvelous living uh, relocating stuff that people obviously don't need and selling it to other people who will give him anything he can get for it. And he also seems to be able to take sinus stuff, you know, that you take for like just ten and make it into something that people will pay huge amounts of money for. <laughs> and uh, I told him, I said, if you ever get a year, call me, but I don't want to hear the stuff. It's too hard. And I wake up every morning. And I tell him, I don't approve of the way he makes a living. I think stealing shit and selling it is probably not what to do. But I wake every morning and I'm grateful that I didn't get a call last night. Nobody shot him. And today he has a chance. And I'm glad. And he's doing what he needs to do. The people that are buying this reprocessed uh, nasal medication need it. Because they need to get to their bottom. And it's obvious that people buying this discount stuff need it. He's doing what he needs to do and he'll do it until... It gets him where he needs to be. So I can accept it or I can like it. And because Alcoholics Anonymous, I learned that by having a different attitude, guy told me, an old guy, my father, he made this stupid statement that attitude is the window through which you see the world. And if your window's dirty, it's a dirty world. Friends, my name's John. I'm an alcoholic from Vancouver, Canada. I know I'm too young and too good looking to be an old timer, but the reality is I had my last drink on July 6, 1987. And there's a couple of reasons I want to share here tonight because Captain Cook was actually very significant in my sobriety. And, and the second reason, more importantly, I want to go back to Canada and they're going to say to all my friends in AA and the fellowship, Wow, John, how was that cone around up? And I'm going to tell them, you know what? I was a speaker on the main stage, and I got taped, you know? I spoke at the Kona Hawaii Convention. And they're going to say to me, John, you are so spiritual. And I'm going to say, yeah, I spoke on the most spiritual planet. Anyway, oh, God, what does this tell you in a short time? And I'm going to try and get the message Back to Captain Cook. I was a young alcoholic. You know, I got, I was thrown out of five high schools. You know, so anyway, after the five high schools, um, I remember I was 16 and a half years old and I begged my mama for a car. And I didn't have a daddy because my daddy was killed when I was nine years old because of drunk driving. So I had a mama with three older sisters. And the neighbors used to look in at our house and say, how's that kid going to survive that household with four women on top of him, right? Anyway, I was a spoiled brat, even though my mother worked hard. And so I begged her for this car. And she said, John, I'll get you that car under three conditions. It was a 1980 citation. She said, one, you never drink and drive. Two, your grades at school go up. And three, you go to church. 
And within three months, I had my first impaired. I was kicked out of school, and I didn't set foot in a church door. You know, so anyway, that's how it carried on. The first impaired, the second impaired. So now I was looking at weekends in jail, the third impaired. And after the second time and going to jail, I said, I'm never going to end up back there again. Never. It's a terrible place. Anyway, I ended up three times. So anyway, and then that wasn't enough. Then, you know, I went out for dinner last night. I went by myself, the lonely alcoholic, and I ordered pizza. And the bartender said to me, what are you doing here? Like, you know, I said, I'm at an AA conference, right? And she said, wow, that's great. She says, I've tried a few of those meetings. I'm a work in process, progress, right? I said, that's okay. You're a beautiful natured woman and your time is your time. It's not me to tell or teach or anything, but anyway, so in 1985, I went over the top. So alcoholic, calling myself an alcoholic was a, not a nice thing. It was a stigma. It was a dirty word. It was very hard for me to accept, you know. And anyway, I was in 1985, I ended up in the Puzzle Factory in Vancouver General Hospital, you know. And I remember being in the quiet room, and I wasn't very quiet. And uh, these two doctors come in, and I said, doctors, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? And they said, John, you know, you're a manic depressive. And I said, thank God. <laughs> I thought they were going to call me an alcoholic. I thought I'd go in over the top, and there was no return. One too many LSD trips, and, it, you know, the mind was gone. Anyway, so I went to my very first meeting in that puzzle factory. A friend came to me and brought me to an AA meeting. And uh, for the very first time, I was exposed to you. And it wasn't a comforting feeling because my life was exposed. You guys knew all about me. And it wasn't very comforting. It was like, oh, my God. You know, my gig was up. I'm out of the secret. So then, in, anyway, I, I got released from the hospital. I went to a meeting, and I cried like a baby, right, at an AA meeting. I said, I can't drink anymore, you know. And they just, they were very nice people to me and whatever, so I stopped drinking. I stopped drinking for six months on my own, and it was the worst six months of my life, right. And uh, I was the most depressed, loneliest. I had to walk down the lanes. My family had to put food in front of me like a dog. And anyway, I thought, you know, I'd walk through Skid Row and see the people drinking, and I had just envy for them. At least they had friends. At least they had laughter, right? I don't have nothing. I'm the loneliest guy on the planet. And uh, so anyway, I thought my destiny was to die drunk. So I went back drinking. Me and my daddy, you know, we're going to die drunk. And after uh, a year and a half, I made the phone call to Alcoholics Anonymous. And my life had been a lot worse, believe me. But it was time to make that phone call. And I picked that up. And the girl the other line says, John, I admire your courage. It takes a lot of courage to pick up that phone. That's our courage. And she told me where three meetings were. One was six blocks from where I lived. One was a mile. And one was three buses and ten miles. So me and my keen alcoholic mind took the three buses and, you know, went, went to the ten-mile one. And I, it was the longest bus trip of my life because I didn't know what I was walking into or what, what if, you know, I didn't really have a lot of faith that this place was going to help me. And I did, and I walked in there, and the very first speaker, his name was Blaze. He was a Native Canadian guy, and he talked about eating in dumpsters and getting thrown in jail for vagrancy and, you know, drinking at these sordid desk, you know, places. And I thought, shit, maybe I've gone a little too far here. But he talked about how he felt in this process. He talked about the emptiness, the loneliness, the lot of friends, the isolation. And I thought, shit, man, that guy knows what I'm talking about. And he was getting his GED at Langara College, and I thought, wow. Wow. And they had a literature stand after the meeting ended, and I walked over and I loitered around the literature stand because I was terrified, believe me, of saying hello, reaching out my hand. And someone said to me, are you new? And I said, yeah, I'm new. How can you tell? <laughs> Anyway, she says, a few of us are going for coffee. Would you like to come? And I thought, really? You want me to have coffee with you? Are you sure? Yeah, you come with us. So we walked the six blocks. And you know where we went for coffee? We went to Captain Cook's restaurant. And Captain Cook's was a dive. It was a greasy spoon and it had bad coffee. But to me, it was the Pan Pacific. At that particular moment in time in my life, I just felt their love engulf me. And anyway, it was now, they said, now we're going to another meeting. I said, another meeting? It's 11 o'clock at night. Like, what's happening? How many meetings do you guys go to? So anyway, you coming? Yeah, I'll come. So they went, and I heard it again. And at the end of the meeting, they said, is there anybody new here? 
that would like to stand up and identify it. And I said, yeah, my name is John, and I'm an alcoholic. And they just engulfed their love around me. These long Indians with their tattoos, they put their arms, and I was home, right? And anyway, it was the most incredible moment of my life. I took that bus home, those three buses back to the North Shore where I live. And I just, it was the best bus trip of my life. I knew everything was going to be okay somehow, right? So that's where my journey began. I was very passionately involved here for 19 years. I was the brother Teresa of Alcoholics Anonymous. Believe me, no one was a bigger service junkie. When you took people's inventory, I was the last guy that you thought would graduate. Okay, I ran Atlanta clubs, I ran for chair of our lower mainland. You know, I was very involved. And uh, anyway, no, 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 no. Please, it's not about clapping here. It's there, there ain't no seniority in this gig. Believe me, I know that. I arrived here two days ago. You know who carried the message to me? It was someone with three months sobriety. I was celebrated my 50th birthday on Wednesday, April 18th. She said, can I take you out for lunch for Mexican food to help celebrate your 50th? I thought, really? You want to do that for me? See, I need to get to that place again, always stay at that right size that I had at that first meeting. A friend of mine two months ago, he's my hero now in Alcoholics Anonymous. It ain't the circuit speakers anymore. Sorry, Dave. But... um this guy is just quiet, unsung, and he just works the program. But he asked me, would I give him his cake, right? And I said, wow, you want me to give you your cake? You sure? You sure? You, you, you know, anyway, it's a privilege and an honor. Um, after 19 years, I got a resentment. I let the principles over the personalities beat me, okay? And they can. It's one day at a time here, right? So for four years, I lost my way in Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay, I've never been cut off, but I will. But anyway, I've been here two years. I'm back with you. It feels really good. I found my chair again. My daughter is going to have a one-year birthday tomorrow. I'm going to miss it. But anyway, thanks for letting me share. My name's Stan. I'm an alcoholic. I'm not sure why I get up here, but I'll make it brief, okay? Um, if I make it to July 1st without drinking, I'll have 22 years, and I'd have a lot more, but I'm not that old. So what I wanted to share was something that I... Wanted to share at the last meeting. It's it's nothing that I've really done. It's just uh, well, real quickly, as I qualify things, my wife said I talked too long on the aside part of it. We were down in Florida, and I got a call from this guy named George that I knew about 15 years ago back in Pleasant Hill, California, where I got sober. And he said, is this a Stan Bourne? He used to live in Pleasant Hill. And I said, yeah. So anyway, we got to remember. I remember who he was, and he said he was coming to the bash. And the point I bring up about him is he told me about this fellow, Robert, that I used to see back in Pleasant Hill. Going, He would always be outside the meetings, and uh, there was something not quite right with him mentally. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't look down on him, but I never really figured he's ever going to get the program. He's going to do anything. Um, and he'd come into the meeting sometimes and have coffee. I don't remember him ever sharing anything or whatever. And I'd, once in a while I'd say, hi, Robert. Um Long and short of it, because I said I'd make it brief, George told me last night that Robert now uh, has 18 years, and he and George told me real quickly what it, Robert had told him happened to him when he was a, a kid. He fell out of an apple tree and hit his head on the pool. He missed the water by that much. And he said that destroyed, he was telling George, destroyed about 30% of his brain. He said the other 30%, or well, 30% more, was destroyed by alcohol. But, you know, to me, it's so meaningful that this guy, I, I can't say I wrote him off, but I never figured he's going to get anything. And here he is with 18 years. And so it's nothing I've done. It's just how wonderful the program can be if somebody's persistent, some compassion from somebody else. It wasn't me necessarily. Um, it, it can do wonders, you know, and we think some people will never get it, and they can't. So out of here. So uh, I'm a very, very grateful alcoholic, and my name is Maggie, and and I got sober in uh, on July 14th of 1983. Now, when I first started coming, uh, it was like uh, the old timers were people who had 20 years or more. Then I went over to the convention in November in Honolulu, and it was 25 years. And I thought, oh, I better get up before it's 30 years. <laughs> so uh, here I am to say hello. And uh, I also um, am leaving the island. And I'm moving uh, to Albuquerque. And uh, 
And I know exactly why I'm doing that, because I feel called. My daughter called me and asked me if I'd come and be with her. And uh, I said, I'll check with your brothers and sisters. And I did that. And uh, and now I know I'm on the right path. But it's not easy to live here <laughs> because I love you deeply. I'm grateful for this uh, spending 20 to 30 years of sobriety here with you. So um, I, I uh, say goodbye, and uh, and I will never leave, and I know that. Thank you very much. Hi, my name's Gordon, and I am an alcoholic. Uh, my home group is the Happy Hour Group in Reno, Nevada, every Tuesday and Friday nights. Um, <clears throat> my sobriety date is April 11th, 1981. And uh, since that time, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink, smoke any funny cigarettes, or stick a needle in my arm. And for that, I'm entirely grateful. Um, I just want to—I want to echo what Pat said. You know, <laughs> the newcomer is the most important person in the room. And when I got here, my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous was at Mountains Community Hospital, Lake Arrowhead, California, in the chapel. I'll never forget that because that's when I started finding my way. And you guys told me, don't drink, go to meetings, read the book, get a sponsor, work the steps, get a home group, and get into service. And you told me if I did those few simple things, my life would change. So I jumped in, you know, and I went for it. And, you know, my life changed. It's so much better now. It's so much calmer now um, because of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I'm 31 years sober. As of a week ago Wednesday, and I want to tell you what I just said that you told me to do when I first came, I still do today, because that's what works. Thanks for letting me share. Hi, my name's Jerry, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm uh, here from Carlsbad, California, and my sobriety date is May 15th, 1985. And uh, I wanted to, to share some experience, strength, and hope with you. So what I did is I jotted down seven things that I've learned in the time that I've been here, and that's what I wanted to pass along. The first one is I learned that Alcoholics Anonymous is about more than just alcohol. Uh, it, I didn't know that this was a way to live. Had no idea about that until I got here. It got involved. Two, I know that if I take credit for my sobriety, I'll lose it. Hands down. Three is, I know that if I stop going to meetings, I will lose perspective on life, and I will drink again. I've seen that happen to other people, and I believe it, and I don't want that to happen to me. Four, I know if I don't pass this on to other people by a variety of things, even just being in a meeting so I'm present or shaking hands with a newcomer, or trying to just make people feel comfortable in an AA meeting, I know that if I don't do that, I'll drink again. Uh, five, I know that if I don't work to maintain my spiritual condition, I'll lose that and I'll drink again. Uh, my experience is seeing that people who have long-time happy sobriety are those that have established a connection with a hot power greater than themselves. Uh, and I work at that on a daily basis because I don't want to go back the way it was. Six, I've learned that I can get through absolutely anything without picking up a drink. I have a deep belief that I can do that based upon what I've seen other people do. And I know that the only way that I get to do that is if I continue to do all of the rest of the stuff. I have to do the things that not other people told me to do, but what they showed me how to do. I learn by example, not by people telling me, do this, do this, do this. They showed me how to do that, and I try and do that. And lastly, number seven is I know if I don't pick up a drink today, I won't get drunk today, and I can continue to have a good life. Thank you. My wife, in case you're wondering, <laughs> when we uh, got together, her, her daughter uh, said that uh, it was really good that the two of us got together because we're lunatics and we saved two other people from being miserable. <laughs> And we make each other laugh, and um, it's hard to stay mad at someone who makes you laugh. 
and it's a good thing, especially on this trip already. I, I mainly came up here to tell on myself. Um, I'll just say first, uh, I started drinking in 1973, and I used to hate it when the alcohol wore off. I, I wished it would, you know, last longer because sometimes it, I had to go through a lot of trouble to get it because I started drinking at an earlier age. And now I hate it when my my spiritual fitness wears off. Um, we, I went to a meeting Tuesday morning on the mainland, and we got on a plane Tuesday afternoon and flew flew here and arrived Tuesday evening and were wonderfully greeted by a couple of dear friends who who opened their home to us for a few nights before we were going to come here and. Had a wonderful time, went snorkeling, and, and uh, got to watch my beautiful wife pull in a 20-pound Dorado and um, with Johnny's help. <laughs> and um, left there uh, early Friday morning for the big trip to the volcano. I, you know, got to go to the volcano, right? And um, so... Um, Sometimes what can happen is I, I, I start to, um, my spiritual condition starts to deteriorate. I'm the last one to know. And uh, unfortunately, Angie gets it in. So we're driving, and I'm, I'm trying to get used to this new car that I don't know where any of the controls work. And, and the sun's in my eyes, and, the, and the, the, all the signs, the names look the same. I can't hold in my brain like one one. Just, one name from another. Um, they're all A's and A's and O's and <laughs> so we're uh, trying to find these places and uh, finally we stop and I think we got the old hungry, angry, lonely, tired thing going and I did and uh, and I snapped at her at the restroom. She was taking too long in the restroom <laughs> and I can't believe the words that came out of my mouth and. Um, it, the beautiful thing is it wasn't long until we, we were starting to laugh about it. And I was like, you know, wh what did you do? You know, who are you and what did you do with my husband? And um, so, like, after about nine hours of driving and that, and we, 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 we got lost coming here. We overshot it by, like, five miles and, and ended up down the road. And um, and now I'm really cranky because I wanted to get here and take a shower and ease in. And, and, and uh, so we get into the room. And I, I just I just want to lie down on the bed for five minutes, right? And I lie down on the bed, and uh, I go, it stinks in here. <laughs> and I'm like, I jump up out of the bed, and I'm like, smelling behind the bed. And, and Angie, do you smell this? And she looks over. She goes, could it be your socks? <laughs> We had gone hiking to Kaka Falls, and I had taken my socks off and left them on the night table. And so I'm grateful to uh, be able to keep coming back. <laughs> Hi, my name's Kelly, and I'm a grateful alcoholic. My sobriety date's January 23rd, 1989. And for that, I am forever grateful to God for showing me the way. Um, you know, I'm fortunate... Uh, Younger brother's mother, who didn't care for me, brought me into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous because she heard I was having a lot of trouble with drugs and alcohol. And um, I was 16 years old. I didn't think a place like this was po I really thought I was in, like, a theater, and it was a act. And it took me a few nights to discover it's really not a play. <laughs> and um, I stayed very naive for a long time. And um, I'm grateful that... After three years of going to meetings, I finally learned how to stay sober one day at a time. And it's odd. Um, a lot of people in my life have gone back out due to pills. And so I do like to get up on stage and mention that because that person is thoroughly in her disease through pills and has not picked up a drink. And that happens to many people in Alcoholics Anonymous. But I've been fortunate to stay here by Unity Recovery and Service and you know, most of my sobriety, I've been very involved and continuously go to meetings and have a sponsor and sponsees and all of the people around me are involved in service. And sometimes people say, well, how do you do it? Don't you get bored? You know, talking to newcomers, you never get bored. They keep your life <laughs> in the insanity of knowing what it can be like, you know, and I stay pretty insane myself. I'm an addict in everything I do. Um, so it's, you know, I always have to remind 
myself to slow down and enjoy life. And I'm fortunate to live in Kona. This was one of my dreams. And anything I think about and write it down, if I work towards it, it's possible because I don't pick up a drink. So thank you all. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous taught me how to love and be loved. And I'm so fortunate to be one of you. Thank you. I'm up here because I can be. I hate that and I love that. When I actually have 7,775 days waking up without a hangover and not drinking the day before and, or did I drink the next day? Whoa! Because when I turned 20, which was a year ago, January, I had then stayed sober as long as I had drank every day. And prior to that, I had drank every, like, couple days. Because I couldn't drink every day. Um, so I was a social drinker till I was like five, you know, and um, I, I'm older. That's not true. Anyway, I, I I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe my husband, who is six months ahead of me, that would be that Stan guy, uh, you know, that we have 21 years. Uh, what? Okay, I love you. I went to my first AA meeting when I was 16 years old and went to rehab when I was 19. And uh, finally got sober at 20. And um, I'm going to be 25 this year, hopefully. November 1st, 1987 is my is my birthday. My point is, um, if you're new and you're young, stay. Come, stay. I, I love, I heard that this weekend. Come and stay. And um, hold on, because uh, y- you're on, you know, you just get prepared for the ride of your life. Because it's this has been an amazing life. There's been lots of ups and downs, but... The ups and downs in uh, sobriety have far, far superseded any crazy, crazy nastiness of uh, alcoholism, active alcoholism. So I'm totally grateful to be here this weekend. Aloha. I'm Jean. I'm an alcoholic. I'm from Long Beach, California. And uh, hi, Angie. And... You know, when I heard someone say they got to speak at the convention, I thought, I'm for that. I I never have spoken at a convention, so now I can say that I spoke at the Big Island Bash. I just love it here in Kona. When I heard they were going to have a a convention here, I hadn't heard of it before, and I thought, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and Kona are two of my favorite things in the whole world. And so my good friend Judith and I are here together. We've been here for a few days, and... We'll have a few more days, so we will get over to the volcano. Um, you know, when I first came here, I just I had no idea what I was doing. I also wanted to learn how to drink like a lady, and uh, I didn't. I think if I'd known that I'd never be able to drink again, I might not have come. But I just kept coming back, and my life is so wonderful today. And to be able to come here... I became a teacher in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I retired in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, to be able to come here is just like the icing on the cake. So I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for letting me get up here. My sobriety date is August 17, 1986. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.